here. Okay, how's it now? Okay, good. All right, so let's get started. Uh, thanks for showing up after the break. Um, I want to thank the, uh, the organizers first. Um, uh, it's always a pleasure to be here in, in Santa Cruz. And also, before I start, I want to point out that uh, a large chunk of what I'm going to show you uh, is based on a work of uh, my postdoctoral researcher, uh, Luigi Bassini. All right, so um, let's get started. Uh, why would we be interested in studying uh, the enrichment of galaxies? Uh, we had, I think, a talk on Tuesday, or two talks on Tuesday, I think, about this, so I can really be super brief. Obviously, uh, I mean, galaxy formation is complicated, and uh, we try to learn about, uh, about the physical processes by studying the correlations that we get from the observables. And stellar mass and gas phase metallicity are uh, two of the most fundamental properties here. The stellar mass essentially tracks the gas that's locked up in stars. Uh, it's also a trace of the star formation activity and potentially of the assembly of galaxies. While the metallicity tells us something about how the gas is processed via stellar evolution uh, and also how the gas is exchanged either via inflows or outflows with uh, the environment of galaxies. So um, if you plot the, the stellar mass and uh, the gas plus metallicity, uh, we can obtain a plot like this, which is the uh, stellar mass metallicity relation, and that is a very tight uh, correlation between stellar mass or luminosity uh, and gas plus metallicity. Uh, it's not a uh, simple power law, as you might uh, see, right? Uh, it gets shallower um, at the high mass end. And uh, a very similar relation, uh, by the way, holds, also holds for the stellar metallicity, so the metallicity of stars. And, and you can understand this to some extent because obviously the stars form out of the gas and if the gas uh, shows this kind of relation, you will also imprint a similar relation on the stars. Now, the normalization on the shape of this relation is somewhat dependent uh, on the measurement uh, the technique, and this makes it, of course, always a little bit um, difficult to compare um, observational data here to the simulation predictions. But, of course, you know, we try our best. So, um, so this was the, the mass metallicity relation at redshift zero in the local universe. But now let's see what happens as we go uh, um, you know, farther back in time. And uh, we find that, in this case, the, uh, the normalization of the uh, mass metallicity relation gets lower, um, uh, well, at least out to redshift 3 or so. Uh, and then what happens at higher redshift, I think, uh, is, still, uh, is still uncertain at this point. But of course, we have amazing new data that, you know, that's coming in on a daily basis now with James Webb. All right. So, Maybe from a physics point of view, what is the origin of the mass metallicity relation? And I think the true answer is that we don't fully understand it, but there have a lot of different uh, like proposals have been put forward. Uh, it could relate it to the mass dependence of, uh, of galactic outflows. It might relate it to, uh, to variations in the IMF or to inefficient star formation in low mass galaxies. Now, one way to think about it or study uh, the mass metallicity relation is with uh, you know, so-called bathtub models. So they offer uh, actually a very nice explanation of where this uh, mass metallicity, uh, mass metallicity uh, of relation comes from. So the basic idea is that uh, you model the galaxy as a single, uh, as a single zone um, with a boundary flux. And uh, we then just use uh, the idea of mass conservation. We have two masses that we want to conserve. The first one is the gas mass. Okay, and the change in the gas mass in this zone, meaning in the galaxy, uh, is just given by uh, the difference between inflow and outflow and star formation rate. And the other mass that we conserve is the metal mass. Okay, and you end up with a very similar equation here. Just have to multiply the inflows and outflows uh, by the metallicity of the inflows and outflows, respectively. There's also another term here um, at the well, the last term at the right, and that of course is related to metal production. Um, in supernova, for instance. All right. Okay, good. So um, now what you can do is you can take these two equations and do a little bit of math, and you can rewrite them like this. And it looks a bit complicated at first. So um, here at the top left, I don't know, do we have a, like a pointer or a, like a laser pointer or something? Maybe this thing? Yeah. Okay. And it's the bottom one, I guess. Okay, wonderful. So um, 
So we have a couple of terms in here. Uh, so let me just uh, super briefly uh, would explain them. So this is the yield. So why is the yield uh, here? Completion time. This is the time derivative of the metallicity. We have uh, Rz in and Rz out are essentially the metallicities of the inputs and outputs relative to the metallicity of the ISM. So Z is the metallicity of the ISM. Um, mu gas is the ratio between the gas mass and the stellar mass of a galaxy. And R is the ratio between star formation rate and inflow rate. Um, and one can show that this is essentially this term, this expression, where eta is the mass loading factor. So the ratio between outflow rate and star formation. OK, good. So um, now what we can do is we can say, all right, we have these many terms. Maybe uh, let's look at this term. And it turns out um, that this term is typically very small. OK, so this is the z dot, or let's say the term of z dot times depletion time is typically um, much smaller than the yield. So we can drop this. Or you can also think about it in a way that you say, OK, what happens if the metallicity reaches a steady state, right? If that happens, also z dot is 0. And so we can drop this term. All right, so um, this is the, then, I mean, this equation that you then get is the equilibrium metallicity. And so just so we get maybe a basic understanding of what that means, Let's just uh, look at a very simple scenario. Let's assume that the gas uh, inflow metallicity is zero, so the inflows are, are pristine, and the uh, and the outflows, let's say the metallicity of the outflows is just the ISM metallicity. Okay, uh, in terms of these RZs, it's RZ in is zero and RZ out is one. You plug this into these equations, you end up with this expression here. So the equilibrium metallicity proportional to the yield uh, divided by one plus the mass loading factor plus uh, the gas to stellar ratio. OK. So this explains a lot. So if you now have a mass loading factor that is the power law, for instance, of the stellar mass, so that gets stronger at, uh, in lower mass systems, right? you can see that uh, as long as this is, say, larger than 1, uh, z scales like m star to the alpha. So you get a power law in the low mass, uh, at the low mass end. But once this uh, eta becomes much less than 1, um, this one here dominates, right? And you essentially get a flattening of the relation at the massive end. Okay, so you had, at least qualitatively, you can reproduce uh, the observed mass metallicity relation. And then you also have this term here, which uh, introduces a secondary dependence. All right. But let's now maybe uh, suppose some questions. The first one is how well does the Bastard model explain the mass metallicity relation? Okay, I just gave you like a very qualitative hand waving argument. But we actually want to see how well this really works. And um, you know, the Bastard model, of course, is super simplified, right? Uh, the predictions of it depend on ad hoc scalings. Like we assume that the mass loading factor is a power law of, uh, of, um, of the stellar mass and so on. Um, and so how do they compare the prediction of the Bastard model with predictions from, from cosmological simulation? And so once we understand this, or once we have convinced ourselves that the Bastard model is reasonable, we can now go ahead and say, OK, let's look at the terms in the Bastard model in more detail and see whether we can now understand what drives the evolution of the mass metallicity relation. Okay? So not only the mass dependence, but also the evolution. How does the mass metallicity relation evolve with redshift? Okay? So this is the basic, uh, the basic idea of this talk. All right, so the approach is as follows. We start with a state-of-the-art galaxy formation simulation. Uh, we measure all the quantities that enter the Bastard model directly from the simulation. Okay, so we don't make any good assumptions here. We, we just measure it. Okay, the only thing we don't measure is the metallicity. Well, we measure it, but we don't use it, of course, in the Bastard model because that's our prediction. Uh, or that's the number that we want to compare it, uh, the prediction of the mass uh, uh, of the Bastard model to. Um, so that's the third step. Okay, so we compare the predictions of the Bastard model to the metallicity of the galaxies. Um, and then we uh, do the next step and see maybe there's something that we can learn from there. Okay? So that's the basic idea. All right, let's start with um, step one, the cosmological simulation. So for this kind of project, we used uh, Firebox, which you have heard about already a bit earlier, so I want to be uh, super brief here. Uh, this is a, a 22 a co moving megaparsec volume, um, has uh, 1 billion gas particles. Uh, at, you know, at the start, uh, it's, um, you know, it's Planck 15 cosmology. Uh, the resolution is very high, uh, at least in the, uh, in the dense interstellar medium. Of course, if you go outside the, the galaxy in the circumgalactic medium, the resolution is much lower than, than 20 parsecs. 
Um, but dynamic range, um, you know, going from uh, box size to, let's say, peak resolution is about a, bit, uh, it's about a million. And we have about 1,000 or so galaxies with a stellar mass of above, as, as, you know, above 10 to the 8. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, it has all the, you know, the typical bells and whistles of a uh, fire two simulations. Uh, we have cooling down to 10 Kelvin. Uh, the star formation takes only place in the dense interstellar medium um, at a 100% at efficiency per freefall time. Of course, we also have uh, stellar feedback uh, in there, let's say various channels of stellar feedback. And um, what we don't have is AGN feedback, okay? But that's okay because uh, for this talk, we actually, uh, you know, want to focus, or I will focus on, on the LUMA, you know, on the, so let's say LUMA's end up to about Milky Way mass. All right, so let's check how well a firebox reproduces the MZR that we uh, see in the universe. Uh, and the answer is, um, you know, kind of reasonably well. It's not perfect. Um, at low redshift, uh, we overpredict the metallicities uh, in massive galaxies. It might be, you know, something to do with that we don't have agent feedback in there. Um, but if you uh, look overall, um, it does a, you know, decent job. Maybe the slope is a little bit too steep compared to observations, but again, uh, these observations here depend also a little bit on, as I mentioned before, how you have to calibrate this, how you measure the metallicity uh, observation. All right, so let's just remind ourselves, this is the equation that we're gonna uh, use. This is the equilibrium metallicity. Now I sneaked in another factor here, this R here. This is the, the mass return fraction. Didn't have this before because I just wanted to keep it, you know, sort of simple. Uh, but this is the, this is the, essentially, the, the full equation or the full prediction of the bathtub model, right, where these are essentially our, um, our parameters. That's the stuff that we want to fit from the simulations. We, uh, we actually also want to fit these ones uh, from, uh, from the simulations, and, and then we can put them directly into this ex uh, expression and see how well it matches the, the metallicity that we have in, in Firebox. I should mention that these quantities are average over one gas depletion time is actually quite important. All right, um, let me skip over this. Uh, if you have questions how we actually calculate this, it's on this slide. I'm happy to answer it afterwards. So the next step is to validate the bathtub model, okay? Um, and see how well it works. And the answer is, well, and this is shown in this, in this figure here. So I show um, the mass metallicity relation at different redshifts, zero, one, two, three, and so on. Um, with Firebox, uh, the black points and the bathtub predictions for the same galaxies are the red points, okay? And you can see that at high redshift, um, the bathtub model does very well. Uh, at uh, lower redshift, um, the bathtub model appears to overpredict the, uh, the scatter in the, uh, you know, in the mass metallicity relation, but the overall trend is the same. Okay, so the mean trend is okay. Uh, and this can be seen here where uh, I plot the mean trend here, and the mean trend is never more off than about uh, uh, 0.1 dex. And the scatter uh, of this relation, uh, as you can see, works, you know, works well at high redshift, and at low redshift in low mass galaxies, um, the BASTA model over predicts the scatter of the mass metallicity relation. Okay. All right, so um, let's answer the first question. How well does the BASTA model explain the mass metallicity relation? Um, we can um, at least say that the Bastard model provides good explanation uh, for the metallicities of galaxies in Firebox. Okay, so if you just use the inflow metallicities and so on, if you measure this directly, you have common simulation, we get the equilibrium metallicity uh, out that's, that is very close to the actual metallicity uh, of these galaxies in, um, in Firebox. The, uh, the, so the second question is, what drives the evolution of the mass metallicity relation? Okay, so we have the mass metallicity relation is really a relation of uh, stellar mass and redshift. And what we are doing now is we, we are replacing this expression here with our equilibrium metallicity from the bathtub model, which is a function of the mass loading factor and these inflow and outflow metallicity ratios uh, and the, uh, the gas to stellar ratio. Okay? And we have an analytic expression for this. So the question that we can ask now is, which of these four parameters is primarily responsible for the redshift evolution of the mass metallicity relation that we see in Firebox? Okay, um, and 
in order to answer this, the approach is to take just the derivative of the metallicity with respect to redshift and see what happens. Okay, so let's assume we take a galaxy that has a certain stellar mass that evolves with redshift. How does the metallicity of this galaxy change with redshift? Well, very simple. We take the total derivative of the metallicity with, with respect to redshift, and then we just use chain rule to write it like this, okay? Uh, where one essentially uh, here, the stellar mass is fixed. So this is really the redshift evolution of the, of the mass metallicity relation. And there is a term uh, which essentially uh, well encapsulates uh, the evolution of the specific galaxy along the mass metallicity relation at the fixed redshift. Right, so you can think of this that uh, any particular galaxy, if it moves like, uh, you know, it moves, let's say, like this, there's a term which, uh, which comes about that um, at a fixed stellar mass, it, the mass metallicity relation changes, and the other term comes from that the galaxy moves along the mass metallicity relation as it grows more massive. Okay. So let's ignore the second term, the, the yellow term for now, and let's just look at this term here, which is really the redshift evolution of the MZR. So uh, we can now write this further down or expand this further, um, where these psi i are these four parameters that we have, right? And these four parameters depend principle on stellar mass and redshift. So for this term, we have an analytic expression from the bathtub model. Uh, and these uh, terms here, we have to measure directly from the simulation. So just as an example, what we do is we look for the mass loading factor, and we plot the mass loading factor as function of redshift in bins of stellar mass, uh, and then we fit this, okay? And that's essentially how we get uh, these derivative terms. Okay, so now we come to the uh, key plot, and it's a little bit uh, a complicated figure. So what I show here now on the y-axis are these uh, four different terms. So let me just show again. So each of the lines will be one of these complete terms, okay? Um, as function of stellar mass um, for different uh, for different redshifts, okay. And let's look first at the uh, black line, which is essentially the sum of all these four terms together. Okay. So uh, as you can see, um, at if you go to high redshift, for instance, um, there. Um, okay, so it's very negative, right? So this expression, this total, this black line, is very negative. This means that the mass metallicity relation evolves very quickly in massive galaxies um, uh, at, at high redshift. And um, while, you know, at the low mass end, there's almost no evolution of the mass metallicity relation at, at high redshift. And things look a little bit different um, um, at low redshift. Okay, so that's, that's the first result. Um, then, if you compare the, the black line with, the, with this gray line, so the gray line is the change in the metallicity of individual galaxies. So as we essentially, we, we don't ask about the population, but we don't ask about the evolution of individual galaxies. And you can see that um, that's about equal to the black. So individual galaxies move essentially equally uh, along the mass metallicity relation, and they also benefit from that the mass metallicity relation changes as well. All right, but okay. But the more interesting thing is, uh, let's look at these four different terms independently. The first one is the gas to stellar ratio, or let's call it a gas fraction. Um, this gas fraction has no impact on the retrograde evolution of the mass metallicity relation. So this has been discussed before, and there has been made a suggestion that maybe the gas fraction or the evolution of the gas fraction is what drives the mass metallicity relation, okay, or, or what drives the evolution of the mass metallicity relation. That's not the case, at least not with the physics we have in fire. Um, and then we see that the evolution of the mass, uh, at the, of the mass metallicity relation at, let's say, Milky Way masses is driven by the evolution of the mass loading factor and to some extent also by the evolution of the outflow metallicities. While the evolution of the mass metallicity relation at low stellar masses is driven by the enrichment or is driven by the change in the enrichment of inflows and also outflows. Okay? So that's the, that's the result. Um, Okay, good. Let me just um, zip over this. Uh, if you want to ask me about the fundamental metallicity relation, I'm happy to uh, answer about that as well. Um, let me just uh, so pull up the summary. So Firebox reproduces the mass metallicity relation over the redshift range 0 to 3, except
except perhaps at the highest masses at low redshift. The BASTAP model works really well in explaining the metallicities of galaxies in Firebox. And by analyzing the various terms that we have in the BASTAP model, we find that the uh, evolution of the gas fraction does not drive the evolution of the mass and metallicity relation. Uh, instead, it's really the evolution of these other terms. So at the massive end, it's essentially mainly the mass ring factor, and to some extent, uh, the, uh, you know, the outflow metallicities. And at, uh, at the low mass end, it's, uh, it's inflow and outflow, uh, let's say it's the enrichment of the inflow and outflow metallicities, or how they change with the redshift. Okay, um, thank you very much. So uh, very nice talk. Um, so uh, as an observer, I have a question. So you mentioned uh, when you compare the um, bus top model and the firebox mm -hmm. and the scatter, um, one is overestimating, the other one is uh, underestimating. So you said the bus top model overestimating the scatter towards low mass. But in observation, we do find that the scatter is increasing towards low mass. So to me, it's more like a bus top model is getting the right scatter and uh, the firebox uh, may be uh, underestimated scatter. So, um, but we can talk about the observation later. So my question is, uh, what um, causes the difference of the two scatters? Yeah, we don't actually fully understand that. So uh, it's probably, I mean, it could be, as we're thinking right now, it could be the, uh, you know, the term that we neglect, which is uh, the Z dot term. Um, so that could ex maybe explain this, but we haven't fully understood this. Okay, thank you. Hi, Robert. Thanks for the nice talk. I had a comment and a question. The comment simply was that we also see similar conclusions for spatially resolved metallicities in the sense that we do think the role of outflow metallicities is really important there. Uh, so that's really nice to see you from Firebox as well. And the question was, can you disentangle the impact of fountain flows from outflows or inflows um, and talk a bit about how that matters for uh, explaining the models on the observations? Thanks. Yeah, so we, we can in principle. We haven't done that. But we can because we do actually use, uh, use particle tracking here to follow uh, the gas particles and see when they come in and out. So in principle, we could. So we could say, OK. You look at the ones that cycle once, cycle twice, uh, and see, uh, you know, what their contribution is. But we haven't done that, so I can't really answer uh, to ask what the result will be. Hi, um, I'm Viraj, over here. Yeah. Oh, hi. I was wondering, um, what is the physical picture for the evolution in the outflow metal city that you're seeing as a function of redshift? Like, what, what, yeah, what's the underlying physical? Yeah. So for? you have to keep in mind. So this is how we set it up, and and you know, it's probably something. We is that um, we define things in terms of limits. Uh, who it come earlier? Um, we define it um, in terms of the uh, of the ratio between the uh, outflow metallicity and the ISM metallicity. So an evolution in that just uh, doesn't mean that the outflows get more metal rich necessarily. They just get more metal rich compared to what the ISM metallicity is. Okay. So um, does that answer your question? Like, yeah. Oh, so why do, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, you mean a function of redshift? Um, yeah, like, I mean, uh, mm. uh, I would just assume that, like, it's going to be the ISM or, like, just naively. But yeah, so I mean, it, okay, so why is always a difficult question to, to say in these kind of uh, simulations where essentially everything happens at the same time. Um, but I would imagine that, um, you know, it's really all about how these outputs are launched. And uh, from the disk or uh, from these galaxies, and uh, there is, seems to be a change in how this happens over, let's say, from redshift three to redshift zero. Uh, the uh, you know the density of these galaxies, uh, the sizes are changing. Uh, you know all these kind of things are changing at the same time, and this seems to have an effect on on what the enrichment of the outputs was to the ISM. But you know exactly pinpointing which physical process it is, I think it's a very tough question. But I, I think it's a very interesting one as well. Okay, so we'll leave it here. Thank you, Robert.